Welcome back to another exciting episode of Ask a Lawyer here on Middle Class Rockstar. What we're talking about today are some lawsuits that have been filed against generative AI software platforms by the major labels. Uh, specifically, this is the Recording Industry Association of America, who represents the major labels, have filed suit against Suno and Udio. So I'm reading here to make sure I get these names right, but both lawsuits were filed on June 24th, 2024. Uh, just to break the fourth wall here, because I think we're going to have to, uh, it's, it is now September 7th, 2024. So we're still very early on in the process as of the time of recording. But the Suno case is called UMG Recordings et al. v. Suno Inc. et al. So that's UMG Recordings, comma, I-N-C, like incorporated, and then E-T-A-L. That's et al. And that just means and others. And then Suno comma Inc. et al. And this is filed in the district court for the district of Massachusetts. And I don't know if it's relevant. Some people may be able to find stuff. If you look at the actual case number, which is one colon 24 CV one, one, six, one, one. And the UDO case is, it also filed on June 24th is called UMG Recordings et al. v. Unchartered Labs Inc. et al. So Unchartered Labs comma Inc. et al. And this is actually in the Southern District of New York. That case number is 1 colon 24 CV 04777. So where we're at in this process here is the lawsuits have just been filed and we have basically a complaint and an answer. And these are civil lawsuits, right? Nobody's seeking any criminal penalties. And we're in federal court. These are federal copyright infringement claims, and uh, they're asserting a fair use defense under the Copyright Act. So we're very, very, very early on in this process. Sure. Importantly, the parties haven't even started the discovery phase of the lawsuits which the discovery phase is where you do, you exchange all your documents, uh, you take all your depositions, a lot of motions get filed there. This is the, the discovery phase is the bulk of any lawsuit by far the longest period. Well, I should say most of the time, sometimes we have really, really long trials, but not months. It's, it's safe to say that the discovery phase is definitely going to be the longest phase of any litigation. And we're not even there yet. So the complaint and the answer, what they contain is allegations that are sufficient to satisfy every element of the cause of action or the defense. So copyright infringement has a number of elements that have to be satisfied and the defenses also have elements that have to be satisfied. And they're, the complaint and the answer respectively have allegations pertaining to each of those elements that kind of sound like conclusory allegations, right? And that's because we're still at the beginning of the process and we don't know if all of these facts, all of these allegations, I should say, are actually going to be proved true, right? We don't know. In fact, they can't both be true. Everything that's in the complaint can't be true at the same time that everything in the answer is the same because they would just counteract each other. Right. So when we're talking through uh, these arguments in the complaint and the answer, just for the listener at home to keep that, I would say just keep that in mind that some of these are going to sound like pretty conclusory allegations. And you might be thinking, well, how would they know that? And the answer is they probably don't know that. Um, now, it has to be based on something. You can't just walk into court and say, you know, start talking about something that you have no basis for believing, but it, it may turn out to not be true or not be true in the same way that the person is saying it. So the plaintiff's complaint shouldn't be understood as this is actual, you know, gospel truth. And the answer shouldn't be read as, oh, this is gospel truth as well. So I'm going to take uh, the plaintiff's arguments in more or less the order they appear in the complaint and kind of talk through those a little bit. Um, one final thought before we dive in here 
is the complaint and the answer are both structured with preliminary statements, which are, in this case, several pages of kind of almost background information and some arguments about kind of AI's technology, uh, AI technology's role in society, you know, things like that. It really kind of goes to the background of this dispute. And the answer has the same structure where it has a preliminary statement and then it actually gets into the the actual allegations. Um, so we've included links to both of these documents so the listener can look at them and follow along. But you'll see that there's a preliminary statement still with numbered paragraphs and then down below with each cause of action are more of the detailed allegations. Um, so one of the arguments that the plaintiffs are making is, look, we know that it's possible to develop these technologies without copyright infringement. Yeah. And the reason we know that, and this is Adam speaking instead of the plaintiffs here just for a second, is Google, what is it called? Google Dream Track. That actually uses pre-licensed material. So the plaintiffs are saying, look, you guys infringed on our copyrights when you developed these platforms, as we'll see. And you didn't have to. That's one of the arguments that they're making. Another argument that they're making, this is important for the fair use defense, as we'll see, is these output works actually compete with genuine sound recordings for streaming revenue, right? Some of these songs that have been created using Suno have been uploaded to Spotify and have generated tons of streams. And that output work would not be possible if they didn't infringe on all these copyrighted works. And it's not fair because the major labels spent a lot of time and money and energy developing the artists who created those sound recordings. And the defendants, the software platforms in this case, took all that, used it, and didn't license it. Another argument that's sort of related to that is the output works also compete for licensing money. So think about why would you ever license a song if you could create an AI knockoff for free or for a lot cheaper? Right now, obviously there's a counter argument there. If, uh, and this isn't in the lawsuit, this is just a philosophical counter argument. But if, a a some company is looking for a specific song to evoke a specific kind of emotion that's associated with that song. Well, then an AI generated knockoff probably isn't going to do the trick. Right. right. But that's what I would note there. Um, and again, this is Adam talking instead of the plaintiff, but this could also completely replace stock background music altogether. Mm. Right. Remember, yeah. at least as it stands right now, and, and certainly back in the day, you would go into a recording studio and there would be a wall of tapes with, they're categorized by mood and length and all that kind of, all the descriptive words that you would use to generate your prompt for the AI. Right. And then you would take that track and use that and it's all pre-licensed. Sure. This technology could theoretically do away with Wipe all that. Wipe that out. Yeah. There's no need for it. So those are kind of more of the background, uh, almost policy arguments that the plaintiffs make. And in terms of the actual infringement itself, this is the crux of the lawsuit, is that Suno and Udio took basically all of the plaintiff's sound recordings and they inputted that into their software platform to train the model so that the software platform would know what a bluegrass song sounds like so that it can generate a bluegrass song, right? right. In order to, uh, another way I've heard it phrased is in order to create a painting, the AI has to know what a painting looks like. Right. So that's what uh, the, the crux of the actual argument is the only way to make this software work is to input tons of data in the form of pre-recorded music. And by the way, we plaintiffs never gave you permission to do that. Yeah. You guys copied these sound recordings without permission. That's copyright infringement. So how do they know this? 
While the plaintiffs designed experiments to run on the software platforms, whereby they used prompts specific enough to try and see if they could generate an, a song recording out of the output that sounds so similar to the original recording that there's no way that you could have that output without actually copying. Mm. That's the idea. So in the complaint, they listed a number of, uh, they actually included the sheet music for some of these songs and they kind of have a side-by-side -side comparison of the original song as recorded by the artist and then the output that they were able to generate. So we could go through one or two of those. I think it'd be fun. And, you know, fortunately for us, we have you here. So you can play these and give us an idea of what these kind of sound like. Uh, we have Sido, who, you know, is a very accomplished singer-songwriter. You know, you can sight-read all these things and, and sing them and, and give us an idea of what they sound like. Okay, in this segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about Suno and Udio and some of these generative AI programs. Um, if, you, if you listen to our last segment, we I'm going to repeat exactly what we did at the beginning where Adam and I gave a text prompt um, to the program Suno about our friendship and reuniting after several years to do this podcast episode, and we asked it to make a song for us. So we're going to do an example really quick and then talk about some of the allegations here, some of the lawsuits between record labels uh, and these companies that are that are creating these uh, that are generating AI songs for us, which we can agree uh, is a lot of fun for those of us that that are just doing it for a good time. Like I want to hear a, a, a death metal song about my daughter. It's fun. Sure. But there's rules and there's and there's laws and stuff at play here, too. So anyway, to start off, I typed this prompt into Suno. This is a song about Adam and Andy. They met in music school at the University of Colorado at Denver. They had several classes together, but their favorite was the Claim Jumpers Trad Jazz Ensemble, where Adam played drums and Andy played piano. Since graduating over 10 years ago, Adam and Andy have stayed in touch periodically. Now they are reuniting in person for the first time in many years to create the greatest podcast of all time. <laughs> okay, and now uh, last time I shared the first song, which was a bluegrass fiddle female vocalist song. This time I asked for hard rock with big drums and shredding guitar Sure. with a male vocalist. I'm in. And uh, this is what Suno pumped out. I'll just put it up to the camera here. It's rock. Yeah. Some shredding guitar. Okay. Little segment of the song. The lyrics are Adam and Andy met at school. Oh, Denver's musical delight. Drums and piano they'd play through the night. In claim jumpers, trad jazz, their hearts took flight. Two kindred souls in harmony. A serendipitous sight. I'll skip to the chorus. Oh, Adam and Andy back in tune. A symphony of stories under the moon. The greatest podcast, their voices swoon with friendship so timeless, dreams will bloom. Um, Interesting. Again, I'm kind of blown away, like I said last episode. The music sounds really good. Yeah. The musicianship is is great, uh, but the, the lyrics are met and the vocals uh, are not super great either. And, and I know we didn't take the time to really feed in yeah. something that would get sure prophetic lyrics but yeah uh maybe that's not a fair yeah but uh, uh, two things i would note is again that's descending all the the lead lines are descending or most of the ones that stood out yeah. to me were descending yeah uh that's an interesting thought i think 
Yeah. And yeah. also there's no background vocals. That's kind of weird, right? I think we probably could have requested it. Is that do you have to request that? I I th- think? I think. I haven't played around with the program a ton, but point is that I gave Suno that text prompt and it generated that song for us in about 8 seconds. Yeah. Um that's we can talk about the shortcomings all we want. That's pretty scary impressive. Of course. Um, yeah. So, you know, talking about how this was created, and there's some very touchy copyright laws, this program learned from real people and real people's songs. This yes. person, or sorry, this this program has listened to Green Day's entire catalog. Yes. And... Presumably. Yeah, we're going to talk. Green Day comes back up here in a minute, which is yeah. why we're using them as an example. But so what's going on here? There's a couple lawsuits, both both with Suno and uh, Udio that were just filed, a, a, I guess, a few months ago. Yeah. What's the deal with that? Yeah, it's a lawsuits were filed at the end of June. And the allegation is simply that in order to create these platforms, in order to create that output, I, I'm going to use five finger death punch as an example they're not named in any of these uh in any of the the things that i've read the pleadings that i've read yeah but that kind of sounds like five finger death punch right so the allegation would be that you can't create that without having listened to five finger death punch or you entered a rock song hard rock song yeah well the software platform has to know what hard rock sounds like yeah the only way to let the software platform know what hard rock sounds like is to expose it to a bunch of different recordings of hard rock music yeah and in order to do that the allegation is there was a copy made or more likely several copies made through that process yeah in order to expose your platform to these types of music that's the allegation. Okay, but in order for me to learn piano, I had to listen to piano players, right? Not just reading out of books, but I was, I was, uh, you know, in songwriters too. I was listening to Elton John and Warren Zevon and people like that. When you learned how to play drums, yeah, you were listening to uh, Alkaline Trio and Blink One Eighty Two yeah, and Limp sure. Biscuit. Uh, so how is this any different? Well, I didn't create copies of those records i didn't copy slipknot's self-titled record i bought it on cd i put it in my cd player and i played it through my headphones while i was playing along yeah that's how i learned it i didn't then take but it some of that it. but some of those beats that you played along with made it into your own playing and became a part of you well that you would replicate on other sessions and other songs here's where we get to the interesting point here okay remember every recorded song has two copyrights the sound recording and the musical composition here all we're talking about is the sound recording yeah why because the major labels probably don't own the rights to the musical composition sure they probably just own the masters that's why they're suing the company you suno and udio yeah so we're not talking about substantial similarity we're talking about duplicating the actual song recording itself. I see. That's the allegation. Okay. And we have an example that that we're going to play. Should we jump right into that or was yeah. there something else? No, let's go for it. Yeah. So let's jump in. Um, in, in the lawsuit with UDO, uh, somebody fed the program the lyrics to American Idiot by Green Day. Yes. And... This is what it spat out. We're going to move the mic real quick, but I will play um, the original. I'll, I'll sing and play the melody, very basic, of the original American Idiot by Green Day, as well as um, what Udio spat out when given, when given a prompt. Yes. Here's American Idiot by Green Day. Don't want to be an American idiot. Don't want a nation under the new media And can you hear the sound of hysteria The subliminal mindfuck America And When Udio was given the text prompt With these same lyrics and asked to make a song This is what 
Yu-Gi-Oh came up with. Oh, it's in a different key. I got to. Uh, it doesn't matter for the for the copyright purposes at all what key it's in, but uh, just for me. Don't wanna be an American idiot. Don't want a nation under the new media. And can you hear the sound of hysteria? The subliminal mind, fuck America. They're pretty similar. Different, it may be different enough. I don't know. I actually can't answer if they're the similar or different enough. Keep in mind, again, the lyrics are the same because the text prompt was the Green Day lyrics. So no one's making any issue over the lyrics here. But in terms of the song, I don't know. The The rhythm is pretty similar. Adam, what do you think? Yeah, so we just heard those two. And I would note that uh, you said the key doesn't matter for copyright purposes. That might be true if we were talking about the musical composition. But again, we're talking about the sound recording. Uh. We're talking about actual duplication of the song record, the sound recording. So we're not talking about whether the green day version well we are talking about whether the green day version is similar to the udo version but it's only to prove the point Mm -hmm. it's only to prove the infringement of the sound recording itself again the allegation is that there's no way that udo would be able to come up with that if it didn't hear green day american idiot right and there i think you know yeah, I think they are going to have some problems here. One of them is there you inputted the lyrics. So how many different rhythmic combinations can you have with those lyrics? With those lyrics. Sure. So that's one of the problems that they they could have. Another problem that they may might have and this is just me talking here and thinking out loud is we don't know how many tries it took to get that. There could be hundreds or thousands of tries where they inputted the same lyrics and didn't get something similar and just didn't include that in the complaint. Sure. We don't know. Yeah. That'll all be borne out in discovery. But, uh, when the documents are exchanged and when they do depositions, right. A deposition question could be to one of these developers of UDO, uh, or I should say to the plaintiff, if that, when they're taking the plaintiff's deposition, they could say, okay, well, how many simulations did you run? Yeah. You know, what exactly did you input? Because right. that, that's not in the complaint. Right. The actual text prompt. What did you input? Yeah. So they might have a problem there. Um, also in the complaint, just to round out the plaintiff's allegations, the plaintiffs are trying to sort of get ahead of the defense that will be raised, which is fair use. And the fair use doctrine, there, there are four fair use factors in the copyright itself. And fair use is just kind of the way it sounds. It's this is copyright infringement, but it's still permissible because of these factors. That's what it's saying. So in other words, in order to assert fair use, you have to be sued for copyright infringement and you have to have actually infringed on their copyright in order to assert this affirmative defense. Right. So there, the plaintiffs are arguing in the complaint. They're just trying to get a, they're, they're saying, Listen, we know the defendants are going to say that this use is fair. It's a fair use. But we're telling you it's not, and here's why. So they go through the factors. Uh, The first factor is the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Well, here the argument is Suno and Udio have each raised hundreds of millions of dollars in funding. Yeah. And at least as of right now, for these plaintiffs, they paid zero dollars in licensing fees. Right. So that's clearly, this is the allegation for the plaintiff, clearly a commercial purpose. Second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work, um, which is getting at, is this kind of the, the type of work that the Copyright Act was designed to protect? We're talking about recorded music, so the answer to that is yes. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think the defendants would argue that that factor weighs in their favor. I think they would concede that that factor weighs in favor of the plaintiffs. Yeah. The third factor, and again, these are not the exclusive list of factors. These are just the four that are enumerated in the Copyright Act itself. The third is the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the work itself, the work as a whole. And here I think the argument is, well, they at least copied the most crucial elements of the song, elements of the sound recording, Mm. 
Why? Because the software platform wouldn't really work very well if it didn't copy the most recognizable parts of those sound recordings. Yeah. That's the whole point. And then the fourth factor here is the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. And I, I mentioned this earlier that in the preliminary statement, the, the plaintiffs say, hey, these are damaging the our work's potential streaming revenue and licensing revenue. So that's kind of some of the complaints or some of the arguments that the plaintiffs made in their complaint. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. So basically we're just waiting for more guidance on, on what's allowed and what's not allowed. And, um, as far as what's going to happen with these cases, we're still kind of waiting. The jury's still out a little bit. Yeah, the jury is very much out. The, the, there is no jury at this point. No, no, we haven't even gotten that far. We're still, again, we're very, very early on in the process. And all we have is the complaint that I just went through some of the aspects of. And then we have the answer, which is responding to the allegations in the complaint, as well as the defendants give their own preliminary statement going through kind of the background. Yeah. Who do you side with? Are you allowed to say? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's going to be the fact that no documents have been exchanged, no depositions have been taken. It, it's really, uh, well, I guess jumping into the actual answer filed by the software platforms, they admit to copying. The software platform said, yes, we did copy your sound recordings. But the only reason we did so was so that we could give our software platform the sound recordings to analyze for the building blocks of the music itself. So quote, what various genres and styles sound like how songs in those genres and styles are harmonized and structured, the characteristic timbres of the instruments and vocalizations in those genres and styles, etc. So none of those things are copyrightable, right? These are just general kind of trends in the genres so that you as the user can input a specific genre and know what's going to come out of it, or at least have an idea of what that's supposed to sound like. So that's kind of their, uh, that's their, they admit to copying, but that's why. Mm. And sort of stepping outside the answer in the media, the software platforms have made some other kind of allegations or defenses, uh, you know, for their position. One of which is just that they've eliminated any barriers to entry except an internet connection and understanding kind of what you want to hear in terms of creating music. Yeah. So you don't have to be a good, you don't have to learn to be a musician to, to create, something. to create music. You no longer have to be able to create music to create music. Yeah. That's what they're saying. Yeah. Anyone in the world with an internet connection can now figure this out. Yeah. They're also saying they're likening this to you listening to whatever your favorite, you're listening to a bunch of Anders Osborne and then writing music on your own. Well, clearly his work is going to influence that. That's why you're doing it. That's mm -hmm. why you're listening to it. Right. Um, they also have raised the argument that at least Suno has, they apparently Suno has some guide rails in place or guardrails, I should say, so that you can't use specific artist names in order to generate an output. Um, so that's that's big, right? Because then you can't just go, hey, I want this to sound like a Green Day song, but mm. about whatever. Yeah. Um, and their argument, another policy argument that they've made in the media, again, not in the answer, is that they're not trying to replace the artists. This is a rising tide raises all ships kind of argument that they're just trying to get more people interested in music. Mm. And this is a way that, lay people so to speak people who don't know what a c major scale sounds like can create music right so that's kind of again that's stepping outside of the answer itself um but to go back into the answer and addressing the the direct infringement allegations and really kind of spelling out the fair use argument they say that the defendants say that this is a fair use because nobody heard the copies Right. They copied the music on the back end just so they could show that's the, the word they use in the answer is show the model 
different genres so that it knew what it sounded like. Um, and really the crux, the ultimate thing, and this is kind of getting a little bit in the weeds here, but ultimately what the defendants are arguing is, Hey, in previous cases, there have been fair uses, even when there's unauthorized copying and those unauthorized copies are used to develop a product that directly competes with the infringed on works. Yeah. So that's their real argument is that, Hey, this is a fair use, just like all these other fair use cases where the use has been held fair. Uh, even though those technologies, it's really a technology thing has been, you know, has competed with the actual infringed on works. And there, I will say, Adam will say, that seems to be true. I didn't read all of the cases. I, I read some of them. But fair use is a very fact-intensive inquiry, as we saw with those factors. And again, those were just four factors, not an exclusive list of factors. Mm. So that may be true that other uses have been held fair in those contexts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this one will be fair. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it remains to be seen. Uh, there's just a lot of discretion and a lot of gray area here. Um, I think the four factors when we walked through them for the plaintiffs seemed pretty compelling again, based on what we know that yeah. Yeah. these songs are out there generating streams, uh, could be generating licensing revenue you know, it, it remains to be seen, I think. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming by and, and uh, chatting with me about uh, about this and hearing a little bit about the lawsuits. It's all interesting stuff because it's so new and it's something that everybody's interested in. Musicians, non-musicians, uh, you know, there's kind of tools for everybody with this stuff. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>